Most people imagine the Sahara as a place where nothing generous can survive. A landscape ruled by heat, silence, and sand. But hidden in the southern edge of Morocco, something remarkable has been happening on the rocky slopes of the Anti-Atlas Mountains. Water, one of the scarcest resources in this region, is being pulled straight from the air, collected without electricity, and delivered to villages that once lived on the brink of thirst. This story begins in a landscape shaped by hardship. For decades, communities across the Anti-Atlas struggled with water scarcity in ways that affected every part of daily life. Rain barely touched this region. The few wells that existed grew deeper each year, carrying more salt than fresh water. Families would wake up long before sunrise and walk across steep, stony ground just to fill a small container that would serve them for the entire day. It sounds simple from a distance, but this ritual controlled everything – children missing school, crops failing, and health centers struggling to function. Water wasn't just a basic need here. It was a limit that determined how far life could go. But every morning, something unusual unfolded on those mountaintops. While the valleys below baked in the rising heat, thick fog drifted inland from the Atlantic Ocean and wrapped around the peaks. It crept through the rocks, clung to shrubs, and disappeared shortly after sunrise. For generations, this fog was ignored because it couldn't be gathered by the hand, stored in a bowl, or seen as anything more than a passing blur of white. But a group of German engineers from the Water Foundation in Munich saw something others didn't. They saw water hiding in plain sight. Their first step wasn't to start building. It was to listen to the land. They walked through the slopes, measured wind speeds, studied fog patterns, and waited for the right conditions. One of their most interesting clues came from something small and easily overlooked. Moss. Patches of moss survived on exposed rocks where rain never fell. This meant moisture was arriving from the fog. Tiny droplets no one had ever tried to use. If moss could survive on fog alone, maybe entire communities could too. But the challenge wasn't discovering the fog. It was figuring out how to capture it. Fog is delicate. A single gust of wind can scatter tiny droplets almost instantly. A standard flat net would tear, clog, or shake violently in the mountain winds. The Germans needed a material that could catch droplets gently while also surviving storms that hit these slopes without warning. After months of testing different shapes, fabrics, and structures, they created a three-dimensional polyethylene mesh with fibers designed to condense moisture as efficiently as possible. This wasn't the smooth plastic most people know. It was textured, layered, and spaced in a way that allowed fog to pass through while holding on to the droplets. When the fog brushed against it, tiny beads of water formed, merged, grew heavier, and slid downward. To support the mesh, tall steel frames were anchored deep into the rocky ground. Everything had to be done by hand. Workers carried metal pipes up narrow paths, hammered support rods into the hillside, and adjusted each frame so that it faced the direction of the strongest fog flow. There were no trucks or machines at these heights. Just people, tools, and the determination to make every drop count. Eventually, this system earned a name that reflects its purpose, Cloudfisher. And once the first set was installed, the transformation was immediate. Every morning, when the fog rolled in, the mesh began to shimmer as the droplets gathered. Soon, Thin streams of water trickled into gutters attached along the bottom edge. These gutters fed into a system of pipes that guided the water downhill using nothing more than gravity. No pumps. No fuel. No maintenance-heavy machinery. Just wind pushing fog through a net. Depending on the season, a single panel could produce anywhere from 60 to 100 liters a day. A cluster of 10 could provide up to 1,000 liters. Enough for cooking, drinking, washing, and even small gardens. For the people living below the mountains, it changed everything. Instead of waking before dawn to walk for water, families suddenly had access to clean, safe supply right where they lived. Children returned to school. Farmers planted vegetables again. Health workers had clean water for treatment and sanitation. It was as if new life had been breathed into the villages. But the engineers didn't stop there. They continued improving the design, making the mesh stronger and the frames more adaptable. Parts of the Anti-Atlas experienced some of the strongest coastal winds in North Africa, 
and the fog collectors had to survive gusts powerful enough to bend metal. To tackle this, the team introduced tension cables that allowed the mesh to flex, absorb force, and return to shape without tearing. These upgrades meant the system could work year-round without collapsing during storms. By 2018, the largest fog harvesting project in the world stood on those rocky peaks. 31 Cloudfisher units covered nearly a thousand square meters of mesh. From the collectors, a network of pipes stretched more than 26 kilometers down to storage tanks built close to the villages. These tanks could hold nearly a thousand cubic meters of water, enough to support entire communities for weeks. And as fog continued arriving every morning, the systems collected more than 36,000 liters a day. Month after month, year after year, when you add those numbers together, something extraordinary appears. Millions of liters of clean drinking water pulled not from rivers or lakes, not from desalination plants or deep wells, but from mist floating in the air. Villagers who once lived with constant scarcity now depended on a resource that visited them daily from the Atlantic. For the first time in living memory, these communities had a stable water supply. The system also transformed community life in a practical way. During construction, the German engineers trained local technicians to handle repairs, replace damaged mesh, and manage water distribution. This meant the technology wasn't just dropped into the region. It became a skill owned by the people. The small fees collected for water usage were invested back into maintenance, creating long-term sustainability without external dependence. Yet even with this progress, Fog harvesting isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. Some regions in Morocco don't receive enough fog to support cloud fissure systems. Those areas still rely on wells, rivers, or even water trucks during dry months. This contrast highlights a bigger point. Solutions to water scarcity must match the land. What works on fog-covered mountain ridges might not work on flat desert plains. But in the places where it does work, the results are life-changing. And this story doesn't only belong to Morocco. Similar experiments are now underway in other fog-rich dry zones around the world. The Canary Islands, Chile's Atacama Desert, parts of Peru, and even sections of Namibia. What started as an ambitious idea in the anti-atlas has grown into a global conversation about how simple, nature-driven technologies can offer answers to some of humanity's hardest problems. But while Morocco's mountains were discovering water in the air, another part of the world was facing a very different environmental struggle. In northern China, deserts were spreading across farmland and swallowing communities. There, people weren't fighting thirst. They were fighting sand. And that is where the next chapter of this story begins, showing how two very different landscapes reveal the same truth. Nature can be part of the solution if we learn how to read it. Northern China might seem worlds apart from the fog-wrapped ridges of the anti-atlas, yet the challenge it faced was just as severe. Instead of lacking water, China was losing land. Entire regions were being overtaken by the slow but relentless crawl of desert sand. The winds carried dust for hundreds of kilometers, turning skies orange and burying farmland that had supported families for generations. By the late 1990s and early 2000s, the situation grew dangerous. Beijing, one of the world's largest cities, found itself repeatedly blanketed by massive dust storms. Visibility dropped to a few meters. Schools suspended classes. Hospitals filled with people suffering from respiratory issues. Flights were grounded as giant waves of desert sand rolled in like weather fronts. The threat wasn't theoretical anymore. It was hitting the heart of urban life. Many people believed this was simply nature's brutality. After all, the Gobi Desert is enormous and ancient. But scientists began revealing a more complicated reality. Yes, there were natural patterns at play, but human activity had helped accelerate the crisis. Overgrazing stripped land of its vegetation. Deforestation opened bare paths where roots once held soil together. Mismanaged farmland suffered from erosion that allowed sand to creep in. The land wasn't just drying, it was collapsing. This pushed China into launching one of the largest environmental projects ever attempted, the Three North Shelter Forest Program. Most of the world knows it as the Green Great Wall. While the name sounds bold, the early attempts were anything but smooth. 
Billions of young trees were planted, but many didn't survive. The soil was too loose and the winds too strong. Fresh saplings simply couldn't anchor themselves against the desert's pressure. This early failure forced a return to basics. Instead of rushing to plant trees, engineers and environmental scientists decided to restore the land in stages. They started with something incredibly simple yet surprisingly effective, straw checkerboards. Workers placed bundles of straw into the sand in large square patterns, forming a grid-like mat that covered the dunes. To the untrained eye, these straw squares look almost decorative, but they held scientific value. The checkerboards slowed down wind speeds at the surface and trapped moisture. They reduced the movement of the sand, allowing the ground to cool and settle. Eventually, the stabilized dunes created pockets where seeds could survive long enough to sprout. This approach wasn't glamorous. It required patience, manpower, and long-term commitment. But it gave the land a fighting chance. Once the dunes were secure, drought-resistant species were introduced. Soxol trees, for instance, could stretch their roots deep underground to find water. Desert poplars were planted in areas where groundwater wasn't too far below the surface. Both species could survive heat that kills most conventional plants. Together, they slowly built a green barrier across northern China, calming dust storms before they reached cities and protecting farmland from being swallowed. Over time, the effects became visible. Satellite images showed that patches of green were spreading across regions once written off as lost to the desert. Dust storms decreased in frequency and intensity. Air quality improved during certain months of the year. And although sandstorms still happen, they no longer arrive with the same ferocity that once shut down half the country. The green Great Wall isn't perfect, but it stands as proof that environmental damage can be reversed with patience and scientific insight. Now, you might wonder what fog nets in Morocco and dune stabilization in China have to do with each other. They might seem like separate stories. One brings water from the sky, the other holds back sand on the ground, but both share a deeper lesson about how humans can use nature's own processes to solve problems. When we think of environmental technology, we often imagine massive machines, pipelines stretching across continents, or giant desalination plants that hum day and night. Those systems have their place, but solutions don't always need to be complex. Sometimes the smartest ideas are the ones that respect the land's natural behavior. Morocco's villagers learned to capture fog the same way moss has done naturally for centuries. China's engineers learned to let straw and simple square grids tame the violent desert winds. Both approaches show a kind of engineering that is humble but powerful. It recognizes that instead of fighting nature, we can guide it. We can work with the patterns already present, fog drift, wind movement, soil behavior, and shape them into solutions that last. That philosophy isn't just beautiful. It's practical. It's the reason these projects have endured. In Morocco, cloud fisher systems continue to provide thousands of liters of clean water every day. The villagers maintain the equipment themselves, fixing panels and checking pipes when necessary. Because the design is simple and doesn't rely on electricity, it keeps working even when storms knock out power in nearby towns. Rainfall is unpredictable, but fog is almost guaranteed on those mountain slopes. And as long as the Atlantic keeps sending its morning mist, water will keep flowing. In China, the Green Great Wall stretches across several provinces, and more sections are still being added. Scientists test new soil treatments, experiment with different tree species, and use satellite data to monitor how vegetation changes over time. The project isn't stuck in the past. It evolves. And because of that, its impact continues to grow. Together, these stories remind us that the world's harshest environments aren't hopeless. They simply require patience, observation, and creativity. Whether you're facing a desert that steals your land or a climate so dry that fog becomes your only reliable source of water, the solutions don't need to be dramatic. They need to be thoughtful. Think back to the families in the Anti-Atlas. Their lives shifted from survival to stability because of a mesh panel that captures something as delicate as fog. Think of the farmers in northern China who now have a chance to grow crops again in places once swallowed by sand. These changes didn't happen overnight but they show how small interventions can ripple outward and transform entire communities. 
It also shows something deeper. Progress doesn't always roar into a landscape with engines and smoke. Sometimes it arrives quietly, dripping one droplet at a time down a plastic mesh. Sometimes it moves slowly, held together by straw squares arranged in a pattern that looks almost too simple to matter. But when these quiet solutions are given time, they build new realities. They give people the dignity of stability, the freedom to work, and the hope of a better future. There's another angle here worth noting. Worldwide, many regions are now facing water shortages, land degradation, and climate extremes. Countries in South America, the Middle East, Central Asia, and even parts of Europe are searching for answers. Fog harvesting and dune stabilization might not work everywhere, but they offer a framework. Start by understanding the land, then build something the land can support. These ideas are spreading. In Chile's Atacama Desert, fog collectors are being installed near fishing communities that rely on fresh water to preserve their cash. In Peru, mountain villages are experimenting with fog nets to support small farms. In Namibia, researchers are studying how fog along the Skeleton Coast can be turned into a reliable drinking source. The ripple effect that began in Morocco is now crossing continents. And as more of these projects emerge, one thing becomes clear. The future of environmental engineering isn't just high-tech. It's human. It's shaped by curiosity, persistence, and the willingness to try something that seems almost too simple at first glance. The next time you think of deserts, fog, or vast stretches of sand, remember these stories. Remember the villagers who no longer walk for water. Remember the families in China who watch seedlings grow where dunes once stood. These transformations aren't miracles. They're the result of people who looked at nature and asked, what if we worked with it instead of against it? If this story inspired you or taught you something new, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. More powerful stories about human resilience, nature, and innovation are on the way.